Hello, everybody. This is Sue Frederick, and I get to have a mystical conversation with you today, the kind where we lose ourselves in the wonders of divine mysteries, share dreams from the other side, intuitive nudgings, and soul mission yearnings. This is what happens when we lift above our ego mind and review life from that place of open-hearted divine inspiration. Hello, I'm Sue Frederick, author of eight books, including Through a Divine Lens and Bridges to Heaven, and I'm a lifelong intuitive, master numerologist, ordained unity minister, and soul regression therapist. I've helped thousands of clients help find their way through this tough realm that we call life. For more information about my work, you can go to suefrederick.com. However, I have the greatest gift for you all today. I just can't even hold back my enthusiasm. My guest is the beautiful, amazing, and unearthly, heavenly Farrah Gibson. And I'll spell it for you because her website is her name, F-A-R-A-G-I-B-S-O-N.com. And let me read a little about her to you. Um, she's a, an angel soul. Let me just summarize and say she's hardly here on earth, even though she's the most realistic person you have ever met when she gives readings on the stage. <laughs> little <Catholic. laughs> But she um, says that by the time she was a teenager, she was already giving people readings and seeing spirits from the time she was a child. And when she saw Sylvia Brown and John Edwards on their TV shows, she said to herself, well, whatever disease it is that John and Sylvia have, that's the same disease that I have. They made her feel normal again because they were exhibiting the same abilities that she had had her whole life. Now, she has three books out, and the one I love so much is called Heaven's Voice is Within Your Soul. Let me tell you yeah. one other thing. She is involved with Helping Parents Heal, which all of you who follow the pod podcast know is my heart. I love Helping Parents Heal. And last week, and she spoke at the Helping Parents Heal conference in August. And then last week, she came to a big Helping Parents Heal meeting. And I got to sit at the front row and watch this woman give random readings to strangers in the audience that knocked my socks off. I can't even explain it. Farah, would you explain how you do and what you do? <laughs> Yes, yes. You know, I think because I'm such a matter of fact person and I am so no BS myself, I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss on here because I am a little cussy. <laughs> um, so I'm going to try to be good. <clears throat> I think that one of the things that I learned early on, if I was going to deliver this, I wasn't going to let heaven make me look like an idiot. So I really have strict guidelines for them. Like if I'm going to bring something through, it's going to be specific. It's not going to be a general statement that I could give to anybody like, hey, oh, they love you. Oh, they're with you or they're watching over you. I want them to give me some example of that I want them to walk me through moments that there's no way that I would know there's you know and this is the day and age of Google and social media and so I really also challenge them to also give me something that could never be Googled or could never be looked up and so you know because people go well why there's a Facebook there's a there's Google there's this there's that Right. But the things that I'm telling you, although I'm not in control of what is out there on social media, what I can say is that your loved ones can trump that and give me yeah. more. And that's really what I work with them on. I watched that happen in person on Sunday. And, you know, um, I remember in particular, this so many of those moments stood out for me. But if any of you ever get the gift of watching her work, she'll come up to first, she's on the stage, revving up her energy. There's no other way I can explain it. Like she's <laughs> rubbing her hands together and you can just yeah. see her whole body vibrating. I mean, when she talk about it, Farah. When all other mediums want to like calm themselves and, and maybe get to a quiet space. It's so funny because in the green room is an example at the Healthy Parents Heal Conference. I'm in the green room with all these other mediums. We're getting ready to do, go do the medium scramble on stage. And, and you know, Elizabeth comes in and she says, okay, would everybody like to do like a little meditation beforehand? And everybody's like, yeah. And everybody, it's kind of like I was a kid in church, like where everybody's praying and I'm just like obnoxious because I was like, everybody was bowing their heads and they were all like really calm and beautiful. And I'm like, let's go. Let's go. Like I was just coming out of my skin because I just, I'm, a, I'm more kind of like a put me in coach kind of person versus like needing to be calm. If that yes. makes sense. 
Yes. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I also want to tell people you were wearing jeans and you were barefoot. Yep. And you have lots of tattoos and yes. you don't worry about what languages, curse words might spirit, you know, the kid on the other side who crossed no. at a young age. If he wants to say, let's party with a curse word in there, then you're just going to mm -hmm. say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, you know, if, if they're cussy in life, why do I need to, you know, I don't tr try to sugarcoat anything. If I can bring through their personality, their vibrance, or maybe they weren't cussy in life. And I've got a grandmother who's coming through who is very eloquently spoken and, you know, very intelligent, probably above my pay, le pay level in, in intelligence. I feel a very different energy with each and every one of them. So because I'm connecting with them and the essence of them, it, it really, I like to bring through who they are are because I don't ever say we're the very essence of who we are still exists in heaven so there's no need to sugarcoat that if that makes sense and can I ask you how you um did you grow up with a particular religion that you had to unprogram from yourself or what was your religious spiritual upbringing okay so this is crazy my mom's side of the family is all Mormon or LDS and very they're very you know into the church and they're beautiful, beautiful people. And I love them very much. And my dad's side of the family is Baptist Christian. Um, so there's well, you got heavy doses of dogma on family. both sides. So let me just say that I never had a mentor for what it is that I had. And it's not something that we spoke of. I think back then it was so taboo. And honestly, in my family to this day, it's still very taboo. Um, my mom is still very much LDS or Mormon and she doesn't really want to hear about what I do as a medium. And my dad, it freaks him out. And he also does not want to hear about what I do as a medium. So I had to go through this developmental journey myself. And that was, I think, the biggest struggle for me was because I didn't want to share this ability with the world until I understood it. And the only way that I was going to understand it was to spend time with it. And it's funny because I just watched a talk that Gordon Smith had the other day um, that he had you know, spoken and he was talking about his journey and how he had all this help and how they taught him dynamics of you know, discipline with it. And it's funny because I, I told my husband that night as I watched this, I said, Wow, because I set those same disciplines with myself. I chose not to get emotional during my readings. I mm -hmm. I started setting guidelines with my team and my guides in heaven going, hey, look, you're going to have to remove all of my thoughts, feelings, and emotions because it won't do anybody good if I'm a blubbering, crying mess when I'm delivering messages for them. And I want you to replace my thoughts, feelings, and emotions with that of their loved ones who are going to connect with me. I ask them to use my mind as you know, a place to speak. And, and I asked them to use my memories as a place to download theirs. So it's kind of like a lot of this is when I'm seeing it, I'm walking through it as a memory. And, and they'll be so matter of fact that when, a, when somebody's maybe trying to appease me and go, Oh, I think it means this. I'm like, Nope, that's not it. I don't mind like not grabbing onto the easy thing and going, no, that's not it. And I'll describe it again or throw it to them to show it to me in a different way. Um, but yeah, so I started working with spirit young and just really starting to understand what I had took a lot because I ended up in the ER a few times thinking that I had stroke symptoms or I had headaches that didn't make sense and things like that. Well, tell me and, more about that. How old were you when that kind of thing happened? I would say that was more like in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize is I was getting passing indications on my body. But again, I didn't have a mentorship. So I didn't understand that I not only was I getting passing indications on my body, that I had control of that. So right. as I began to develop a relationship with my team in heaven, um, I really started to learn that I could ask them to lift it off if it wasn't mine. Wow. So, you know, so when I'm getting a stroke symptom or I'm getting a heart attack symptom or I'm getting a cancer in my liver symptom, it doesn't necessarily have to, but I do need to know if it's mine as well. That would be so great. So you offered your body to be the canvas, so to speak, for Correct. spirit. Because I, you know, on Sunday, you would say, why am I feeling such and such in my left side? And I'm drawn over here. And you'd walk over to a couple of parents sitting in the mm -hmm. aisle. And then you'd say, you know, I'm feeling like this seat belt and I'm feeling the car swerving off. And you would describe it like you were in the car going yes. through it. 
Yes, because they walk me through it in my memory. And I even remember there was a validation recently where I felt like my soft spot was shifting to the side, you know, and so um, as a baby. And and so they'll give me like, I'll feel like, oh, wait, I'm missing a finger or my left leg is missing or I had breast cancer and I had a lumpectomy in the right, but my breasts are still intact. So I will genuinely feel that and think it at the same time, almost like a memory. So it's almost like I'm remembering, like I didn't get a full mastectomy, but I did have a lumpectomy, but only on one side and the other side was cancer free. And I I want them to be that specific because those are, you know, because in in an obituary, somebody might put, oh, Mm -hmm. she passed from breast cancer. Right. But they're probably not going to put her journey and, Mm -hmm. and where her removal was and where she was still intact. And those are the things that I can challenge them to give me above and beyond what somebody may have put out there in honor of them, if that makes sense. Yeah. And how do you separate? You mentioned a few times on Sunday Mm -hmm. that you ask spirit to separate your thoughts from the departed's thoughts. How does that happen? How does that work? Very carefully. So (laughs) It's really kind of, did I think that or did that thought come at me? It's really the best way to explain it. So if it's popping at me or popping into my head, you know, I'm kind of speaking to them back and forth. So your thoughts, your thoughts and your mind or your soul's voice speaking, it is so amazingly loud in heaven. They hear every single thought we think because it's the same way that they communicate. And so for me, I just, I, I heard somebody describe it as like a chalkboard at one point, you know, where my words are written in white and theirs are in yellow. So there's not much difference. Right. And, and so, and I don't see them like a chalkboard, but I'm just saying it's like that subtle of a difference. And it's also such a subtle thing. So I tell you, like, you guys can hear your loved ones as well. When you see a hummingbird outside and you go, wow, that's like a really cool hummingbird, you know, that day it's just a cool hummingbird. But when you see a hummingbird outside and you go, wow, that really reminds me of my mother. Mm. um that's your mom in that moment saying hey that hummingbird that's from me I sent that and I try not to bind them to one specific sign with my clients only because maybe it's not hummingbird season and they're not around or butterflies don't come around in the cold or whatever so I don't want somebody to think that they're incapable of like you know they're, they're not around they're not sending me signs the reality of it is they're they're so capable of so many limitless possibilities with their signs that they give. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I say that anytime you see something that brings your thoughts to them, that's them saying, hey, that's me. I did that. Even if it's mischievous. So, <laughs> yeah. so one thing I want to tell the listeners, because I have a lot of numerology clients and students on here. And I'm sure they all can tell that I'm completely in love with you, Farah. And so I want to tell my students and clients that Farah is a 22 master soul. And you guys know that I'm on the same path of the 22. So we're each manifesting it in different ways, but we each agreed to come here to help shift consciousness through a lot of hard work. I have to add that in there. That's part of the 22 four path. And Farah added Aries to be her sun sign. So she's the Aries 22, basically unstoppable. And I'm sure you can tell that from looking at her energy. (laughs) I hope you're watching the video of this just to see her eyes. The only way to describe Farah's eyes is to say they are, they are heavenly, like they're a pure channel from heaven. They're not earth eyes. (laughs) Thank you. And there is a lot of hard work that goes with this. And I think it goes back even, you know, even as a kid growing up, I mean, I went through a lot of turmoil growing up in my life. There was never moments that were really super easy for me. There was a lot of abuse in my childhood. There was things that I went through with my ex that were filled with a major abuse as well. You know, so there's a lot of moments in my life that were extremely challenged. But if I look back on those moments, I wouldn't change any of them because I wouldn't be able to help people at the level that I help them at now had I not been through those moments, not been able to relate to those moments and really just walked in these holier than thou shoes of like, oh, your life's going to be just fine. And they're going, whatever, you've never been through this. And I can go, girl, I can make you like, like you have no idea. But at the same time, my life isn't in competition for yours. Yeah. I'm living my life for my spiritual growth and I'm adding to yours with it. But, you know, it's definitely not a competition. So, so do yeah. you think that you signed up for an intense life because um, you knew that not only would it bring you to this place where you'd be able to help so many people um, and and to give you the depth of wisdom as you're talking, but also because you're an old soul and you just sort of know, you know, before you jump in, hey, I'm not going to go down there and waste my time. (laughs) 
<laughs> right. Not going to waste my time. And it really does take all my life experience to really do these connections for people in a way that I can really relate, you know? So, I mean, they'll show me my memories to really try to be more specific. So, I mean, I did a reading one time for a gentleman who did not expect to have a reading in that moment. And I was at a group reading and this guy was sitting in his easy chair in a gruff, you know, like position the whole entire time. It was the lady that booked the reading with her husband and he didn't want to be there. And so, you know, then at the very end, I said, can I go to you? And he said, give it your best shot. And so I thought, well, game on. He has no freaking idea what he just said there. <laughs> and I felt like I had <clears throat> two Vietnamese soldiers that were coming through and they told me that he had met them in the battle at Vietnam. And he told me, they had told me that he had to take their life. Um, in that moment. And, and they were showing me how he had taken their life. And this man's jaw is just completely dropped. And, and as I'm saying these things to him and giving him specific, you know, ways that they passed and all of all of these moments, you know, what these men were coming through for was really to let him know that they were part of his team, that they were literally lovingly watching over him you know, from the time that he took their life until the day that he joins them again, and they'll high five him again in heaven someday. Mm -hmm. And it's a pact that they had written in heaven long before they ever came here. And so it's really, you know, it, yeah. so you relieved but, his guilt. Oh, amazingly. You know, he actually looked at me at the end of this and he said, I've been in PTSD meetings since the day that I got home from Vietnam and I'll never have to go to one again because I was able to let him know that they were lovingly watching over his team. And, and here's the thing. It was a soul's contract that they had with one another. He wrote to be uh, in our U.S. you know, military and to go overseas and defend our country. But what we don't think about in the human sense sometimes is those Vietnamese soldiers that are meeting him on the battlefield also wrote a life's path to represent their country. And they also write, wrote for their graduation day in that moment to be heroes for their country. Well, how are they going to go as heroes for their country if somebody doesn't fulfill that path? And so this man had to fill that path of love for them. And when I put in that perspective for him, he was like, whoa, now I, I, it's really hard for us to wrap our heads around that in the human sense, because when we go to the military moments like this, we have to learn to hate them on the battlefield. But the reality of it is yeah. it, it's so much bigger than this. Well, you know, when I was in my twenties, um, cause I was, I came of age during the Vietnam war. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of my, uh, friends, you know, going off to the war, my age kids and never coming back or coming back very damaged. Wow. And, um, so I was studying theosophy at that time, which was like kind of the theology meets philosophy, like how do the realms wow. work and why do souls come through? And one of the things I learned or I was taught is that if you agree to go into war in a lifetime, it means you're up for accelerated soul growth because what ha what you experience during war um, it, even if you have to kill someone or someone injures you is such accelerated growth and awareness that it just catapults your, your soul's awareness. And I thought, wow, what a wonderful way to look for me to look at the Vietnam war and think, you know, it's not the, the worst thing in the world. There's actually soul growth happening. Yes. So. There's beauty in everything. If you look at it from spirit eyes, I, you know, I, I walked through a lot of really traumatic passings with my parents that have lost children, you know, or, or children who have lost parents. I don't just do readings for, you know, parents, but, and, and it's, it's something that I always tell them is take a step back to spirit, because if we look at this through human eyes, it's really difficult. It's traumatic, you know, but if we take a step back to spirit and look at it through spirit eyes, where's the growth in this? Like, even right. when, when I have a parent who's present for, you know, their child traumatic passing that happened, you know, like in the house, like let's say they had an accident or something in the house and the parents there and, and trying to help them and through human eyes, it's traumatic. But if I take a step back to spirit, their children could have written anybody in the universe into that moment. And they wrote that person. There's love in that inclusion as traumatic as that moment is to be a part of on the human sense. And so I always try to say like, try to look at it through a spiritual sense. If you can, you're not doing it wrong. I love that so much. Cause I don't know if you know, but my newest book coming out in June is called through a divine lens. And oh, it's yay. all about teaching people how to step back and take that longer view of their tragedy of whatever it is that they're 
um, feeling has victimized them or caused them pain. But you're exactly right. You know, we have these two ways of viewing this life through the physical, through the human eyes. And we have to have that part of our experience. That's why we're here. And then also through spirit and soul, which offers us the healing path through it. And so you help all mediums, but you especially, Farah, really help them take that soul's view of especially the loss of a child, because you and I know, I mean, most of my clients are grieving parents. I'm sure probably half, at least half of yours are as well. And they yeah. have been through the most devastating loss that a human being can experience, but they yes. have a choice in how they will look at it and how they will move forward. And you yes. help them take that soul view. I do. And I think those specifics that I come through with are super important for that. And I learned that. So I wasn't doing readings my whole life, like per se for the public, the way that I am now, those were behind the scenes messages to people that really weren't sharing those messages in the moment. So I wasn't putting together really that I was even a medium and they were not telling anybody about their experience because it was a really private, you know, delicate moment for them. And when I was with my ex, I never shared my abilities. He was extremely abusive. He was extremely jealous. There's no way I could be speaking to strangers with that, you know, but I think that that just really gave me more time for growth and understanding. I mean, everything happens for a reason. And then when I got together with my new husband, that's really when I started unnecessarily sharing it. But the pivotal moment for me to challenge them was this moment. And so we got a call that our buddy Rudy had lost his best friend, Beaver. And his best friend, Beaver, had taken his life by suicide that day. And we got a call telling us that Rudy was up at the bar and we needed to get up there and get to Rudy's side because he was crying in his beer and he wasn't in a good way at the bar. Well, we jumped on our motorcycles. And let's just say that these are boys. Boy, they're men's men. They're not, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's it's definitely a different kind of bar that we were going to. And and, and, and my friends are awesome. Uh, just regular <laughs> down to earth people. And Rudy was having a tough time. And Beaver had not only taken his life that day, but he took all of his guns and $10,000 and put it on the garage floor and left a note of love for Rudy wanting to leave everything he owned to Rudy. This is how much he loved Rudy in life. And this is how much Rudy loves him. And we're sitting in this bar and my husband and our buddy Kenny um, are sitting at Rudy's side. They're trying to console him a bit. I'm just really being quiet. This is kind of a man's face and I'm kind of letting them do their thing. But when I get quiet, I start getting things. Um, and so I'm sitting there and I'm hearing Beaver screaming in my thoughts. Tell him I love him. Tell him I'm with him. Tell him I love him. Tell him I'm with him. Tell him I love him. Tell him I'm with him. And me being an OBS person that I am, I'm going, no. There's no effing way I'm telling him that. I'm cussing at him. I'm like, there's no way. And 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 I'm, you know, and he's still saying it. Tell him to love him. Tell him I'm with him. And I said, if you want me to tell him that, and of course I'm not saying it out loud, I'm saying it in my mind, but I'm telling him, if you want me to tell him that, you got to give me something that's going to catch his attention. This is a no BS kind of guy that's sitting across from me right now. He's crying in his freaking beer in the middle of public. And this guy never would have cried in public. And how effective would I have been if I had reached across the table that day and said, you know what, Rudy? your buddy beaver he loves you and he's with you right (laughs) stupid sorry um because everybody can say that it's not stupid to say it we do the best we can but i mean it would have been stupid in that moment of me to say that because it really would not have been effective and so i'm challenging his buddy and this is really that moment where i realized that as a medium i was never going to give the general because if i'm going to reach people with effectiveness i'm going to have to catch their attention and so beaver showed me that they that he and rudy had gone target shooting together one time but it was just the two of them they had only gone one time and he also showed me a big Coors light and a big f you to um budweiser and i thought okay who am i to judge what i'm getting right i mean really it's not my message it's beavers and it's something between them and I don't know what it means and I have to really be effective in delivering that and not feel like I need to filter something because I'm going to feel stupid saying it so the bar is not the place or the time to say it we get back to the bike shop we get Rudy out of the bar which is a blessing we get back to a bike shop that we were hanging out at and again I'm in a man's space um which I love like these are it's the boys hangout kind of area but I love that I'm welcome there and um And so Rudy's outside sitting on a cement pillar, crying his eyes out with his face just buried in his hands. And I walked outside and I kneeled down in front of him and I put my knees on his, I put my hands on his knees and I said, hey, Rudy. And of course he's not looking at me. He's probably thinking what the hell, you know? (laughs) And I said, you went shooting with Beaver, but only one time, didn't you? And as I said those words, Rudy pulled his hands off of his face and he goes, how the 
did you know that? Sorry, I'm bleeping myself for you. <laughs> and um, I said, well, because he was showing it to me. He said it was just you and him. And he's like, yeah, just me and Beaver one time. That's it. And I said, when he was showing me this big Coors Light and a big F you to your Budweiser, Rudy smiled. <laughs> and I could that's see great. that. And he goes, that's Beaver. And I said, yeah. And now, now that you know that's Beaver, I can tell you he loves you and he's with you because I promised him that I would say it if he gave me something that caught your attention. <sighs> that. So that's how I work. So you just answered my next question, which is, you know, why is spirit so intent on communicating with their grieving earthbound loved ones? How would you summarize that answer? I would say that they want to give us faith that they that we do carry on. People really teeter on faith of wondering if we do or wondering if we don't. And it's a really a don't tell me, show me kind of thing, right? Like you need proof of that. We as humans want proof that we exist after this. And yes, you want to try to have faith. And that's that blind faith of following and going, you know what? I believe, but I've never seen proof. And so I really think that like I say, when when I'm connecting with somebody, your loved ones brought you to me. Yeah. You think you booked with me, your loved ones, if you look at the path in which you ended up in my journey for me to be able to be in your space, to deliver something from your loved ones, that has nothing to do with me. They did it. They set it up. In fact, when I was younger and I didn't know who it was that I was communicating with, I would be like, bring your person to me. I don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. And so I really started telling them, bring your person to me. If I'm supposed to say something to somebody, bring them to me. I don't know who it is, you know? So mm -hmm. yeah. That's so good. I'm so uh, amazed at your courage. I think above all things, you have the courage to speak what spirit is giving you without holding back. You know, one of the things I watched you do on Sunday was you'd go up to a couple of grieving parents and you would say, I'm getting this or this or this. And they might at first go, no, I don't know what that means. But your spirit, the spirit is telling you this. And so yeah. you you just stay there with them. And you're yes. like a dog after a bone yes. until you get the validation that they go, oh, right, right. Now I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. So spirit's working overtime for you to gain that faith. And so I say, you know, like it's called psychic amnesia, right? Like when I'm giving you a message like this, we almost eject our own name at this point. This is super emotional. Sometimes it helps if somebody that knows you is there because they're like, yes, they did. Or, you know what I mean? Like, right. Oh, with that um so i'm not i'm not worried if somebody tells me no i say that heaven is right 100 of the time i may interpret it wrong um yeah. so when when i deliver it to you and i may have interpreted it wrong i'll kind of throw it back at them and when they say no fair plant your feet in the sand like we're gonna you're correct i'll say it again and then i'll still try to throw it when you're still telling me no like it doesn't matter honestly i, I did a reading one time you know some people go well wait maybe you're reading their mind maybe you're reading the person's mind in front of you. I did a reading at a group reading one time. I had a young lady in front of me and her mom was coming through and her mom was showing me this beaded bracelet and, and it looked like pearls to me. And the girl's like, I don't have that. And I said, no, you do. You have this beaded bracelet from your mom. It looks like white pearls. And she's like, no, I don't have that. I would know what I have from my mom. I'm like, okay, well, you can say that, but I'm going to go ahead and write it down because I'm going to tell you right now, mom's planting my feet in the sand telling me that you have this bracelet. Well, two weeks later, I got a message from this girl and she's like, holy crap, Sarah. After the reading, she goes, I got a box of my mom's things that my sister hadn't shipped to me yet. And when I opened the box, the very first thing on the top was this beaded bracelet and it wow. is white pearls. And it's so cool because it's not something that was in her head. It is, it was a little extra kiss from heaven later. Sometimes those validations make sense later. Right. And I'm playing with that. I'm not worried about it not making sense in the moment. Now, if I said like three or four things in a row that didn't make sense, and I have a group type setting, I might actually need to switch people mm -hmm. because, you know, it should emphatically make sense. And the things that, it, that they give me are pretty specific, you know, to, the person that I'm bringing it through for. Um, but typically it's with them and I don't usually have to worry about being with the wrong person. So do you um, feel or believe that you can maintain this level of doing this work forever? Or like, what do you see next for you in your life? Because I know you're also a mom. Tell people how many I kids know. you have. And I know. So first of all, I feel like I have to continue this work. And and, I'm, and my kids are such a blessing that they support that and understand it. Because 
I'm, I am a mom and I have four daughters that I've birthed myself. My husband has two daughters who are adults. My husband and I are 13 years apart. So he's got two daughters that are, um, that are the oldest of our kids. And then he's also got a son who's 17, who's mine. He lives with us full time and he's been mine since he was three as well. And he's got a mom as well, but, um, (laughs) so we have seven kids between us, none together, but, and then we have nine grandchildren as well. So, I wish that I could say that I'm the super involved mom and grandma, but because my schedule is so busy, I, you know, there's a lot of time that I dedicate to this and the kids are like, go mom, go. We're seeing what you're doing. Like, keep doing it. This is what you're meant to do. And I, so I'm really blessed in the sense that my kids, our kids are really supportive. I mean, when I get out of this room today, my 17 year old son, he's always like, how are your readings today? Oh, like, I love so that from great. them, you know, so yes. they love to hear about it and like, well, the good yeah. thing for those kids is they're growing up with the awareness that there is no death, that the soul is eternal, and that spirits always come back with positive yeah. energy and positive messages, you know? I mean, yeah. that's such a, to grow up with that knowingness, that's like the answer to any kind of anxiety or fear or anything like that. Yes. And that's a huge thing that you just said as well, because it is a positive on the other side. And so there is never a negative that comes through from heaven. Never. Now they may talk about a difficult moment that we live through or things like that, but there's never a, they're angry at us for this or they're, you know, I say negativity doesn't exist in heaven. So that is one thing that will like, if somebody tells me I'm a medium too, and, and, you know, and and then they give me something that they told somebody that their loved one was mad about something. I'm like, Oh boy. (laughs) Right. I know. I agree with you about that. Like I'll have clients go, you know, a medium told me that my son was lost in the between realms or something. And I'm like, Oh my God, that is such baloney. You know? Oh, I literally had a woman pull, come into my home for a reading. She was shaking and trembling and she had stopped at a local medium the day before because she got impatience waiting to get into my schedule. And this medium told her that her daughter's soul was stuck in limbo. And for $4,500, she would pray for her soul for six weeks and get her pulled out of that to heaven. And I was like, this is what ruins, this is what ruins people's understanding of what mediums do. I said, please tell me you didn't pay her. And she said, I did. And I was like, oh, I was so heartbroken for this mom. Cause then I made the most beautiful connections with her girl right in front of her. And she's like, how are you doing this? Or she's stuck in limbo. And I said, that's, that's it. She's not. She's there. They are in the most amazing perfection times infinity, the millisecond that they pass. It's us who are broken. It's us who are hurting. And so sometimes we impose that on, you know, how we feel they must be like, they must be missing us and they must be sad that they're not with us. And they must be sad that they didn't finish their life. So to speak, I can tell you right now, they're not sad at all. And they don't even miss us. Missing us would be a negative emotion. Instead of missing us, they're loving us. I so, know. And yeah. I love, you know, that whole idea that a parent will say, and and I have no, no fault. I mean, if I had lost a child, I would be worrying about the same things like, oh, they didn't get to go to prom. And I'm right. looking at their son and spirit going prom. Are you kidding me? This is oh, so God. much better than prom because the divine realms are the most unconditional love filled incredible space of no negativity just constant learning and evolution and connection and then you think about senior prom compared to that you know you know and I get as a parent you know wanting all of those moments like for them to have had babies or for them to have you know had a wedding and see their wedding day and stuff and and those are definite grieving moments that they have every right to you know because those moments are made of love like grief is made of love so our focus upon wanting that for them is made of love but the reality of it is is the love from those children who passed early is so immensely great that they bless their parents with more love and strength than they ever knew they could carry in any other scenario that there would have possibly been so what are your thoughts um because when I work with some of these children they really show up as a team and they and the kids tell me that they crossed early as part of this team of awakening consciousness here to the realization that there is no death and they're kind of all working together and they're building up the juju the energy of it do you believe that's true? Do you feel that when you work with these kids on the other side? 
Oh, I definitely think that, you know, times have changed a little bit as well. And so I think that our kids are, you know, and, and our loved ones in general in heaven are really working to bring more of a spiritual, you know, awareness to all of us, because I think that life's going to be a little bit easier when it keeps getting tougher. This world, you guys, is getting to be a lot more turmoil yeah. than it ever was back in the day when our grandparents, grandparents had a little bit more simpler life. Technology right. was not the same. It was not as congested in areas, you know what I mean? We're, and, and life has changed. We have a lot more homelessness and a lot more violence in the streets and things like that, you know, then, so if they can give us a little glimpse that glimpse that heaven does exist and that spirit is around where our ancestors before us really didn't have that focus a lot of times because they were very religious focused. Right. Um, so this world really didn't seem to exist for them. So I think that heaven's really trying to give that perspective to make this life livable, honestly, so that we don't feel like we need to take ourselves out of the game of life early, right. so to speak, because you can do this. It is possible. Right. And there is hope at the end of this for right. greatness. And and it all makes sense someday. Do so. you believe, Farah, that there are uh, a few or maybe several uh, choice points of when our soul will exit? Or how do you feel about that? I do. I feel like we've written five possible exit points for ourselves. I do feel like there's five. I don't know. You're yeah, I've, I've always gotten three um, to five. <laughs> okay. And I feel like we have possibilities. And so there's very different, we, we're also given free will. So let's, and it's one that I use as an example all the time. So let's say we were sick as a child and we bypassed that and we made it through that illness that could have been really difficult. Maybe we got pneumonia or something, you know what I mean? When we were young and but we made it past that. And then we write this obstacle of, you know, of addiction. And that's one that's just the easiest for me to like approach with this, because what if, what if when I'm offered that drug, I decide not to take it? Well, then I just bypass that possible exit too, because maybe that would have led me around a difficult road and I would have left a little bit sooner than I would have had I skipped that. Let's right. say I skip it and I go on to the next, you know, part of my journey. And 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 so we really have these obstacles that we've written and how we approach them with our free will will really determine how fast we grew. Because if you do take an addiction path, boy, that's not easy. Like, mm -hmm. and so we might grow a little bit faster than we would have if we took the easy route, so to speak, and did the family thing or whatever it is, you know. So I mean, know that those those exit points are written by us and nobody's bigger than our blueprint. I don't feel like God takes us. Right. Um, so when I have parents who are angry that God took their child and I say, no, your child is so amazingly beautiful that they graduated to heaven that day. Right. Nobody took your child. Right. Nobody took your mom. Nobody took your dad. Um but the reality of it is they're more beautiful than you and me because they're in perfection and we're still here doing this. Yeah. <laughs> so. I, I've always said that the enlightened ones get to leave first. <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. still here trying to learn and evolve. I must have a lot of enlightenment to catch. <laughs> oh, honey. No, you're young and beautiful. I, I'm no. in my seventies and I'm the one sitting here saying, you know, gosh, how much longer do I have to be in this school? You know, like haven't I learned serious? it yet? Oh. <laughs> I would have never guessed you in your 70s, ever. <laughs> um, so Farah, what would you say to anybody who might be listening to this, who recently lost, especially a child, but really anyone and feels that they just can't go on? What would your words of wisdom be? I would say that each and every one of us has a hundred percent track record of making it through everything life thrown our way and your children, you know, if, if we did go through the loss of a child, the last thing that they would ever want from you is to give up. They're at your side in pure perfection, cheering on your growth. You still have learning yet to do. So don't give up as much as I, you know, I, I don't want to tell you what you can or can't do or what you're doing right or wrong, because there's no right, wrong or wrong way of doing it. If staying in your bed all day and crying is your way of coping, by all means do that. And they will sit at your side and, and they will love you through those moments of you crying. And if you can get out and start doing one thing a week or one thing a month in honor of your love for them to, to do something for others, whether we pass out one rose, you know, one day a month and, and, and make that, you know, in honor of your child, your children are going to cheer you on no matter what you're doing. And so I always say, I want them to be proud of those moments. And I want to be proud of those moments. Um, you're going to do a life review and you're going to see through your, you know, everyone's eyes, how your life affected them. And a lot of times when a parent loses a child, sometimes the other living children in their home feel like they didn't just lose a sibling, but they also lost a parent because that parent is so focused and dedicated to that death. 
And, and if I could teach you that your other children are waiting for those same traditions to be taught and those same memories to be made, and your child in heaven is not dead at all, still very much alive and, and, and encouraging you to keep living, you know, for all of those around you as well, you know, don't forget and don't forget your work as well, because you're, you're able to take time for yourself and to be in your own space. And that's okay too. So so beautiful. You know, I think the blessing of being able to communicate with spirit as you do, as I do in my way, is that we know we're never alone. And I think yeah. the most devastating thing for people here, and especially I even, I know when I was 30 and my husband died, I went through times where I felt like I was all alone, even though now I look back at that and think, are you kidding? All of my loved ones who had crossed at that time, they were still with me. They were giving me, they must've been so frustrated by me while I was going deep into my grief you know, cause they were like knocking over signs to show me stuff. And I would be like, Oh, but I'm all alone. I'm so pitiful. <laughs> you know, and that's okay. That grief was made of love and they weren't frustrated with you. They would have been loving you through it. Frustration doesn't exist in heaven. So right. yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. All oh right. Well, you are such a gift, Farah. Thank you so much for your time today. And anybody who wants to learn more about the fa beautiful Farah, please go to her website, farahgibson.com. You can also um, get her books on Amazon. And like I said, my favorite one, she has three of them. It's called Heaven's Voice is Within Your Soul. And yes. Farah, it is an honor to know you. Thank you so much. And I do have a Facebook page, Farrah Gibson Psychic Medium as well. And I do share a lot of my writing there. Even if you never buy a book from me or book a reading with me, you might find enough information there to put things in perspective and bring healing as well. You do post daily beautiful writing because I'm on your feed and oh, I, get, I re love your writing. One writer to another. I just got to say you're amazing. Thank you so, so you. much, Farrah. Have a great yeah. day. Thank you. Bye-bye.